Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. Well, you know, historically, journalism as the fourth branch of government is essential to American democracy. Yet American trust and confidence in the media are at historic lows. It seems misinformation, bias, and so-called fake news characterizes much of today's news media. We're joining me in a conversation on the state and practice of contemporary journalism is Robin Reed, a 40-year veteran news anchor and meteorologist with WDBJ7, also a professor of practice in the School of Communication at Virginia Tech, friend and colleague, Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, Bob, thank you so much for the offer to be here and have this conversation today, which I know you know is very, very relevant, and there's so many moving parts going on right now. Well, it really, it really is. And you know, our first thing, I was just really struck by the contrast, historical, in terms of the loss of trust in media. Uh, I noticed from a Gallup poll, um, mid-2022, historic low, just 7% of Americans have a great deal of trust and confidence in the media, 38% have None at all in TV, newspapers, radio, and 28% not much confidence. Yet if we go back even post-Watergate in 1976, 72% had a great deal of trust. So, wow, there really is a big gap now. A couple of things going on there that I think are interesting to note. Number one is the whole concept of polling and uh, surveying and guessing ahead to what may happen. And that's in a bit of a, a tenuous state right now because uh, the last couple of elections haven't been uh, particularly well forecast by polling and that sort of thing. So the, the whole concept of whether polls are accurately reflecting, I think, is one thing to consider. But you're exactly on point. But I was thinking back to um, my childhood and lack of trust of the media then born and raised in the Washington DC metro area where every four or eight years you have a new boss coming to town and so the city was constantly flexing uh, their political viewpoints and I remember uh, and not understanding but about every six months my parents would cancel the Washington Post <laughs> and, they, and it would just go away they would get mad at something they'd read and they would cancel it and then about six months later we'd get a subscription again because we missed the sports page and the funny papers and it would last another six months and then it would be canceled again. So I think that for a lot of folks there was a lot of mistrust or a lot of doubt about reporting and we're talking about a world-class newspaper here but it didn't seem to fit the narrative that they thought that they knew. So I think it's always been there. I just wonder if it was just quietly going on in households all over the country and now we just know about it more. And you know I remember back in 1980, do I dare say that long ago, when I was doing my dissertation at Purdue and in the dissertation, and I came across this, and it was a Gallup poll, and actually included in several writings. And the question simply said, who would you like to see as President of the United States? Very simple. 68% said Walter Cronkite. Yes. Historic figure, yes. CBS News. Um, and I just thought, my goodness, to think that at that point in time, that's the epitome of trust, a news anchor. Um, that people would favor for president. Well, and he earned it with his excellent reporting, uh, whether it be war-based uh, stuff in, in World War II, or whether it be any of the domestic things that he would do. He just had a way about him. Um, and so did the other network anchors, actually. The, the NBC crew was, was very good, and the ABC crew was coming along. It was sort of the birth of broadcast news in terms of it being super impactful at six o'clock across the country. And so, uh, you know, as, as uh, President famously once said, you know, I've lost uh, Walter Cronkite, therefore I've lost the war. And, uh, you know, that was the end of Vietnam as far as uh, public trust. But I, I, the other thing I think is kind of interesting is that um, so much weight was put on one program. So for uh, network news, it was at six o'clock. And Bob, you'll remember the days when the FCC came along. Uh, news was a losing proposition financially. The only thing that made money were the programs. And, uh, but it was required by the FCC that you operate in the public interest. Uh, and so some news was required, starting at 15 minutes and then going to 60 minutes. And then local news sort of getting on board with that and having their program and, and, and starting to generate uh, some important uh, steps, um, but not really making any money. It was kind of a, a loss leader there for a little while, but it was required that you do that. But back then, you'll remember it was just 
two shows maybe, one at 6 and one at 11. So there was a lot of time to curate that program, and for the evening news, there was a whole day or a week or month to curate those stories. So a lot more effort and reflection went into those stories in those days. Absolutely, and one of the things that's a little bit disturbing when looking at that same data today, wow, there's such a difference as is everything, it seems like, in terms of party and politics. Mm -hmm. Whereas you have the divide where uh, just for Republicans, 14% great deal or fair amount of confidence, 17% among independents, but 70% of Democrats. I mean, my goodness, that is quite a separation from a political standpoint. And I think there's, again, a lot of moving parts there too, not the least of which is fundraising. So depending on where you're standing at any moment in time, uh, politically, um, who says the uh, catchy phrase of the day and can they fundraise off of it? And I remember a time years ago, 60 Minutes did a story on the fundraising apparatuses of the um, U.S. Senate. And people like Tim Kaine and Mark Warner would be spending three and four hours a day in, in a booth uh, making phone calls to people and fundraising and then the rest of the time maybe their jobs. And even then, so many years ago that story aired, I can't imagine what it's like to try to fundraise today and how that all fits into the uh, opinion that you have, you know, and so people follow your opinion, there's your 70 percent, but the rest of them don't believe a word you've said because they're fundraising in a different way. Well, you know, we, we, we get to some of the process kinds of things in just a moment, but one thing that really, when you look at it, and I don't realize until you look at the history, is the impact of the shift in revenue mm -hmm. in terms of stations. When it went from advertisers and advertising to individual subscriptions, mm -hmm. and then of course when it comes to the audience and pay linked to individuals, that kind of reorients your whole approach to your job, doesn't it? It sure does, and, and I think maybe it's um, somewhat instructive to pay attention to the fact that um, the company that really set, well, two companies set it in motion, the, the device itself, the, the, the mobile phone uh, turned into a small computer in your, your hand, and so uh, I don't know if Apple knew what they were doing back then, but they've certainly succeeded at making sure that these devices are in everybody's hand. The other thing is um, the fellow that has had to lay off 20,000 members of his staff in the last couple of weeks, and that is the whole concept of what Facebook could do to get the message out there and then advertisers took a look at that and said, huh, I can reach 100 million people for two cents on the commercial. Why would I pay $150, $200 up for a newspaper ad or $50 for a TV ad when for two cents I can reach 100 million people on this device and eventually the metrics were worked out and they, they started working for them and as you know the decline of newspapers was far faster than anybody thought, and they thought it was going to be fast, as it turned out. Well, you know, speaking, um, uh, jumping to, the, I, I don't know that we really realize the impact in terms of the local news and the loss of that. I see since 2005, over 2,500 newspapers are out and have shut down because of ad revenue, and we're scheduled to lose a total of a third of newspapers alone by 2025. And even then, in terms of local stations, boy, fewer reporters, how do you cover? Right. And so I'm not sure, yes, at the national level, and we'll get back to looking at some of the broader issues, but my goodness, I think we're losing the local journalism. To be sure, uh, at the newspaper level, that, that could not be more true, and it, it gets worse every day once they eventually close the newspaper that had three people on staff at the end. You know, that's just... It's, it's a crime, it's pitiful, it's, it's, it's terrible for the communities. When it comes to local news on other platforms such as television, as you know, the, the whole business model changed when the ad revenue went to different places like social media and like uh, apps and that sort of thing. You know, these are ad-based businesses. Their, their whole structure was set for advertising Newspaper lost at first, television started uh, losing it, and then I think they did something very nimble. They saw what happened to newspapers and they immediately changed the plan. The funny thing was, I don't think they knew what the plan was. They just knew they needed to change it right away. And so um, the whole concept of sponsoring your web page, the whole concept of having apps to make sure your, con your content was getting out there, and then 
Bob, th they started consolidating these companies and now three major investment firms own all the television stations in the country and inside of those three they've decided that they're going to generate more money by having more news programs. Well, that's great, but does more news programs mean good solid reporting content or is the speed at which that product has to be delivered and then put away onto the web page, is it too fast? Is it hurting the news uh, program in some way? Uh, having recently retired from a television job, I, I know that I have a positive outlook on what they're going to do, but to be sure, uh, having local stations um, with you know, a few reporters uh, doing their job, um, that's, that's a tall ask. Uh, be interesting to see if time bears this thing out and if they're, they're able to not only just continue to be good at it, but profitable, but what's, what's next? And with these various stations and tied to revenue and more um, subscriptions and what have you, and I think it's helped the balkanization, hasn't it, in terms of the audience. Therefore, we're in these echo chambers. Uh, one of the ironies I find, the beginning of the internet and what have you, information will be limitless. You can find and learn anything, just Google it. You can get an answer to any question. And we thought that that would improve the education level of the citizenry, the knowledge, strengthen our democracy. And yet Pew and Pew Center for Research, I, I respect them a great deal, found the opposite, that the more you relied upon the social media, the less knowledgeable you were. And in fact, in general, our political knowledge has decreased over the last 20 years. And that is really mind-numbing right there. It is, and, and um, we like to use the term citizen journalists uh, in class uh, because anybody that has any kind of recording <laughs> device at all uh, and wants to tell what they just saw uh, out in the world, whether it's uh, a cat doing something silly or whether it's actual news, you know, you're, they're still citizen journalists. If you do that and if you give everybody a voice, um, what happens to the message is it becomes so distracted and then there's a thing called uh, subscription fatigue. You can only subscribe to so many things and you can only pay attention to so many things and there, there is no concentrated message for which people can sit back and think a little bit about. Um, now, I'm reminded that um, there was an old phrase, you know, when your relatives came over, or whatever, you never discussed religion or politics. Or and there was, sex. Uh, well, there you go. And, and so that, that was a thing, right? Don't do that. Um, but now people can discuss anything they want, and there's, um, there's a kind of an addiction to that process. They, they haven't posted to Instagram today, so they must post something. And so you end up with these just diluted messages all over the place. Uh, and most of the stuff that you see that is kind of controversial didn't come from the person who posted it. They've been reposting and retweeting and, and taking somebody else's graphic and, and presenting it and saying, this is the truth. Well, gosh, I can't think of a better way for misinformation to fly <laughs> across the Internet, you know? Yes, you know. Well, here's the thing. Now, you, you may disagree with me on this and take a little historical perspective. And as one of my colleagues, former colleagues, was easily reminding me, uh, Denton uh, is not a journalist, but he plays one on television. <laughs> you know? So he always had that about me. But I think there has been a change in terms of the expectation as it relates to journalism. I'd be curious in your perspective. We started out with the gold standard about this objective reporting. Get the facts, lay it out, objective. But then there was a need for this okay, I've got to show both sides, uh, lay it out, make sure that both sides are covered, multiple viewpoints. And then it got to the notion of maybe a little bit more advocacy journalism, civic journalism or something like that, to the point now there are some say, well, look, objectivity is a myth anyway, always was. But I think there's not an agreement upon the practice or the, m the model or standards of journalism necessarily today. Where do you see that? I see everything that you say is absolutely true. I would just say that I think it's been driven by um, economics. I think that the arrival of storytelling, um, not as a news product, but as a product um, that is just aired on television, and I think the obvious example we can use is um, cable, 
television, which is not regulated by the FCC at the same level as broadcast television is regulated. So that begets the possibility that you could have a cable channel called, um, let's say for example, Fox News or any other news uh, thing you want to do. You can do CNN, you can do MSNBC, but these are cable channels. But if they have the word news in them, there's some sort of expectation that it would be news reporting, when in fact a lot of these channels are opinion reporting. Absolutely. Once you get to that, and once you start generating revenue from that, it's not long before the news side of things has to kind of blur the lines a little bit to be in sync with that. And I think that uh, we've got ourselves a situation where there's too many cooks in the kitchen and they're all grabbing the dollar as quickly as they can. And I think reporting suffers as a result of that mixture. You know, there's a couple of things that come to mind. I remember a colleague who's no longer with us, um, who was a, a journalist and journalism professor and all. And in this kind of transitional period, he'd come running my office. Did you see what that Hannity and that what they're going to and I said, that's that's not a news not program, news. Yeah. the blurring of the opinion yeah. and news. Um, and now we can say uh, um, opinion journalists. Mm -hmm. We know there's always op-ed people and what have you, but that blurring of the line for entertainment versus news is really another confusing and confounding factor. It certainly is. And I think that um, it, it's not going to go away. It's too profitable. Um, there are certain people in this world that have learned. I was reminded the other day just uh, uh, I told the students about something called yellow journalism. And they looked at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and we pulled up a couple um, uh, newspapers from New York uh, in the 1930s. And there wasn't a single truth on the front page of some of these, these things. They were purchased by candidates or they were made sensational in order to do what? Just sell the paper. Th that five cent newspaper you're trying to sell, you've just splashed it with all kinds of things that were not true. And while the people knew that, that's what they were faced with every day. And that was in the 1930s. Well, a lot of years later, and a lot of things that we're seeing are, are not true. It's just coming at you faster and from more angles. Absolutely. And in, in, in the early days of our nation, these partisan presses, I mean, my gosh. That, that, that it was, so there is that kind of um, um, changing there in terms of some uh, of some of the norms. What, so let me just ask you this question that's very open-ended, because so many people, and it's one of the questions I get most of the time about the liberal bias in the media. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of biases in the media, <laughs> sure. but nevertheless, you think there's a liberal bias historically, st systemically, to those who go to the journalism as a profession? I don't think so, but I recognize why people think so. Um, the uh, reporting, um, I'll remind me to get back to the answer here, but reporting <laughs> has changed for me since I retired. I've been out of the business of doing it day by day uh, for about five months. Now I'm an observer just like everybody else. And by golly, from that chair, I see things slightly differently. And even though I know in my heart that these people are doing the best job they can, I sense uh, a slant. I sense not a bias so much, but just a not quite correct reporting, incomplete reporting, which then gives you the idea, well, you talk to the person on this side of the story, but the other person was unavailable for comment. And then you fleshed that story out and aired it. Well, you never did get that other comment, right, that would have perhaps informed you're reporting a little bit more. So the speed is, is one thing, but um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think, I, sure everybody's biased. Um, sure we've, we can't vote uh, both ways when we go in the booth. You can only vote one way. And so using that, okay. And, and it, it tends to be on one side or the other, depending on wh what part of the country you're living in. I don't know. I, I think a good journalist has been trained to try to tell the story that they believe as truthfully as possible and not tilt it one way or another just because they feel that way. I think we're human beings. Maybe sometimes we fail at that mission just a little bit in the end product. But you know, there was a day when that story had to go through multiple layers of editing. And if an editor, a cagey old veteran, uh, didn't like what they saw, they generally told you. Yeah. And I do think, just like a teacher, they tend to be more empathetic, caring, a little bit softer than mom or dad, yeah. you know what I mean? I mean, going to, 
Um, and those who are curious in terms of journalism thinks that a story can make an impact, shed light in an area that needs to be looked at. But there's no question, especially uh, in the last 10 to 15 years, if you ask the journalists, and they've quit answering a lot of these surveys, mm -hmm. did you vote for a Democrat or Republican? The contributors we know tend to be more uh, democratic. Um, and so there seems to be from a uh, philosophical perspective, they tend to be more progressive by definition. But it's in the practice, if you're trained, you can control this, almost insulting to say, from a professional standpoint, that you, that um, we, yes, we all have bias. One thing that I remember well, and, and I do this, I, oh gosh, I may be making a confession I shouldn't make. Um, I don't vote in primaries, because right. I don't really consider myself Democrat or Republican, but I know by course that there are some journalists in this market who do not vote in primaries because that might, not only is it public knowledge, but also didn't want to get too much into the game. And I find that an interesting. Yeah, it's, uh -huh. it's restricting their ability to do, you know, what the country was set up for just because of what they do for a living. And that's, that's kind of a, a sad statement in a way. So we have five minutes or so remaining. I want you to, if you today, in this context, two things. One, define for me, as you would in your class in teaching your students, what is news? And how do you approach the students today in this profession of where we are in terms of journalism? I'd be interested. We begin with just a structure because they have no structure when they come into this uh, idea of being a reporter. They just have ideas and everything sounds good. Um, but they need a, they need a, a sort of an outline to, to to start with. So we begin with um, a general concept of um, this is going to be your beat. So let's say we're on the campus of Virginia Tech. Your beat is dining services or your beat is parking services, which is always a very popular oh, yes. word, by the way. And so this is your beat. And over the next uh, few days, we want you to go uh, look at some stories that you think might come out of this uh, beat. And so then they come back to the classroom, which we treat as a newsroom. So everybody that's in the classroom, all the 20 students, they're fellow reporters. And so I may be the executive producer, but they're reporters. They take their idea and come into the class and say, I would like to pitch this story as worth reporting on. Here's what I see positive, here's what I see negative, and the rest of the students determine whether that's newsworthy. And you'd be surprised, but very often they'll push back hard on some of these ideas as, you know, I want to go interview my roommate or whatever. That gets laughed right out of the room. <laughs> so they do their pitches. They get thumbs up or thumbs down. We send them out into the world. They gather their content. Very often they don't know what they're going to get because they only have an idea of what this story could be like because they don't really know how parking services works at Virginia Tech until they go there. And they get a lot of no comments, by the way. <laughs> Nonetheless, they gather and then, then they begin the process of, of journalistically seeing if they have a story. Bob, sometimes they end up with a completely different story because they listened carefully during the interview and they heard something and as leaned into it and said, ooh, this is a better story continued to gather the information. Then we have to get into the nitty gritty of making the bacon and, and making this happen. So they're on their computers and they're, they're editing or whatever. And then their product is finished and then it's displayed to the class as a finished product like in a newscast. And then we have to determine if that, that cut it or does that storytelling need to be elevated? And we do this in a somewhat repetitious fashion over 16 weeks, and sometimes we end up with a pretty good journalist after all that. <laughs> we only have a couple of minutes remaining, so taking a look back, I mean, my guy did 40 plus years and, and experience and what have you. Again, a couple of minutes. Journalism per se is not going away, but look down a decade or two decades, where are we? And are we at danger in terms of the practice of journalism? That's, that's a good word to use. It's a short amount of time, but I'll tell you, I actually started 50 years ago. <laughs> and I was in Australia at the time and uh, in a single wide trailer doing radio. And it was fascinating. I loved the atmosphere. I loved the whole thing. Fast forward a little bit, and now I'm in professional broadcasting. And by golly, in those days, the newspaper was the first thing you read in the morning. Mm -hmm. it, was the, it was the information of record. And from there, you determined whether you could make a TV story out of it. You always turned to the newspaper first. You didn't copy it, but they were your assignment editor. Now, as we move forward in time, it, that's not available anymore. Um, you can go to websites and look and see what people are reporting on, but pretty much you have to go do your own local digging. And with 
now nine, 10, 11 shows to do, uh, how, how deep can you do the digging? You can't, it's a 30 second story, it's a 60 second story, not well curated and not well edited, but it's on, it's off. Might be about dogs <laughs> and, a, and a shelter. And I love dogs in the shelter. So it's just the speed at which things are changing. And um, I, I, danger, danger to you and me, because we know what it used to look like. I am curious about what is evolving, because honest to goodness, I don't think anybody knows. Well, this has been delightful. Believe it or not, we're out of time. I miss you, my friend. I miss you, sir. I miss you. That is all the time we have. I want to thank my guest, veteran journalist Robin Reed, who's professor of practice in the School of Communication at Virginia Tech. And of course, I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.